so much. We have a nice big group here today. Uh, my name is Colleen, and along with Bridget, we are co-hosts of the podcast Hot Flashes and Cool Topics, where we talk about anything to do with midlife. And we have invited two of our friends on the show. They are past guests on the um, on the podcast, and it's Maggie Sarachek and Abby Greenberg. Hi, guys. Hi. So I just want to let everybody know that Abby and Maggie have a book out called The Anxiety Sisters Survival Guide. And that's kind of what we're going to talk about now, creating a survival guide for your anxiety. Because I don't, I honestly don't know many women over the age of 40 who don't have some anxiety or depression that they are working with or struggling with. You guys are also podcasters of the spin cycle, which is a really cute title. I kind of love that. Um, So welcome, guys. Thanks for coming to this Revel session and speaking about anxiety. It's such an important topic. Thank you. We're so happy to be here. We love talking to to everybody, but especially to you guys. We love it. <laughs> you girls. Yeah. So yeah, what, you- we love your podcast. Not, see, oh, now yeah, we became you. forever listeners. So now we listen. Yes, yes, exactly. Well, thank you. The topic Thanks. this week yes. is testosterone. Yes. Just so yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> very good. Very yeah. good. Oh, thank you. Great. So let's talk a little bit about um, your, your personal experiences with anxiety. Abby, if you could start, just what have you been struggling with and, and how long have you been struggling with it? I, my first memory of real anxiety was when I was five years old. And I, it's funny, I remember at five having obsessions and compulsions. Like I remember that I was afraid to get in my parents' car unless I would tap the tires three times. So I would walk around the car, but I had to make sure nobody was out there because I didn't want anyone to see me doing it, but I would tap each tire and then I'd get in the car and then I would think I'd be safe on the car ride. So I remember that happened when I was five, I was diagnosed with obsessive compulsive disorder at 46. So there was some suffering in between. (laughs) Wow. Okay. And what about, what about you, Maggie? Um, You know, like Abby, I remember as a fairly young child, I had a lot of separation anxiety. Um, And I would say that the panic attacks and the Um, Some of the agoraphobia happened um, a little bit after my father died when I was in my 20s was really when things escalated about six months later, which is actually very, very common for anxiety, six to 18 months, six to 18 months after a death, it's um, of someone close, it's very common for people to develop anxiety symptoms. So that that was like, that was sort of the start of really intense adult anxiety. Um, and I think for Abby and I, both of us, I can say it was sort of a long journey, which is why we started the Anxiety Sisters to help maybe give some tools to other people. So their journeys will be a little less long, um, <laughs> but we are, I would say both of us will always be anxiety sisters. That's sort of how we're wired toward anxiety, but neither one of us suffers from panic anymore. And we also don't, we also don't suffer from the type of situation where anxiety makes the decisions for us. So we may get anxiety, but we, we just say, you know, hi, and we're still going to decide where we're going you know, who we're going to see, what we're going to do. So I can say that's a place we are now, but we will always be anxiety sisters. Well, can we you would share love- how- oh, oh yeah, I was going to say, can- how'd you get there? <laughs> yeah, or how did you two meet? You well, know? we've yeah. got a book for you. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> uh, oh gosh. Well, well, first, uh, the first way we got there was with each other. Uh, for me and Mags, there's been nothing more healing and more powerful than our connection with each other. You know, we're, we're called the anxiety sisters. We started calling ourselves that and now everybody calls us that. Um, but we are not really biological sisters, we're soul sisters. Um, and I think a lot of women can relate to that. Um, having that, that woman in your life who is just your rock and your touchstone and the person who won't judge you no matter how crazy you sound. And that, that's been me and Mags for, for the past 35 years. We met in college in the 80s and we were just kindred spirits, kindred panicked spirits. <laughs> I think we both, um, you know, we're, we were experiencing a lot of anxiety uh, symptoms at that time, um, which is 
the first time usually in, in an anxiety sister's life where it comes out really strongly is right around that kind of late adolescence, 18, 19, 20. That's kind of the sweet spot where it first starts to rear its head for many people who are going to journey with it for life. Uh, and so we were very fortunate to find each other right at the beginning of that, uh, even though it took us a long time to even believe that what we were suffering from was anxiety. I mean, you know, we we sort of talked all the time in college about, Maggie talked about her terrible stomach and it was so bad. She said to me, you know, I'm sure that I'm going to die from this. I don't know what it is, but it's got to be really bad, you know, and I had such cardiac stuff going on. So I was like, well, you know, I'm going to have a heart attack at 30, you know, and, and we kind of really believed that. And even after, you know, the decade that Maggie called it our decade of the is our entire twenties, we spent going to every ist that existed. We went to the therapist and the nutritionist and the psychiatrist and the cardiologist and the past life regressionist. She's not lying. The past life regressionist, <laughs> the hypnotist, <laughs> everybody, any, any is that would take our money we went to because we were just so desperate. We were feeling so awful. We were struggling with leaving our houses. It was really, our, our lives were, had been taken over by anxiety by that point. And even though we did have some people tell us you have anxiety, it was really hard to believe it. So it really wasn't until our until our 30s that we finally were like, all right, well, we ruled everything else out. I guess it has to be anxiety. And that's really and then we decided to focus on our careers um, and sort of obviously took professional interest in anxiety since that was our whole world anyway. Uh, Maggie went on to become a social worker. I became a professor of communication and we started conducting research right away. Uh, we wanted to sort of find out from the horse's mouth, what anxiety feels like, not just from us, but from everyone around us. And we ended up compiling this ethnography of thousands of sufferers all over the world. Um, and sort of the experience of anxiety, what it feels like, what works, what doesn't work. And so between our experience and all of these, this ethnography we were able to build, that was how we sort of figured out, all right, we've got a secret sauce here. We kind of know now what we can do to make sure that that when anxiety shows up, it doesn't get to drive. And you say it doesn't get to drive, but for so many of us, especially the you know women who are attending here, it's still in the driver's seat. You know, mm -hmm. I'm very honestly, I have mm -hmm. anxiety disorder. I've had the generalized anxiety disorder for years. And back in your 20s and 30s, they didn't call it that. You were, right. you know, an overachiever. You were just nervous to take a test. You were, you were type nervous, Nelly. You were right, nervous. Right, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that kind of, when it's ignored or kind of pushed under the rug, it builds. And then all of a sudden your hormones come into play and your hormones are going crazy and you start getting these panic attacks. So can you talk to us about what you have found is the general number one, feelings that midlife women start to get? And two, what are some of the things we can actually do about it? Well, I just want to tell you a statistic that's, to me, it's mind boggling. 25% of women, when they enter perimenopause, 25% of women who have never experienced anxiety before in their entire lives develop panic when they start going through menopause. That's a huge number, right? Wow. One in four is a huge uh -huh. number. So we know that what you're all feeling, what we're all feeling, it's real. It's, you're not making it up. It's not, you're not dreaming it. It's a real thing. And we, and we know that our hormones, that the female hormones, progesterone and estrogen really have a lot to do with our serotonin availability in our body and our chemical processes that are behind the fight and flight response. So it makes sense then that at times when your hormones will be in flux, so that would be puberty, it would be when you're pregnant, it would be postpartum, it would be, and menopause, perimenopause, those times are gonna be when your hormones are most in flux. And therefore it's gonna make the most sense that if you're gonna experience anxiety or depression, that would be when it would show up. And in the number of women who, if you've experienced anxiety and depression before the age of, of menopause, then the number 25% goes up to 60%. Wow. Now we have a question here that says, have you experienced speech arrest during a panic attack? Someone oh, started experiencing garbled speech and then actually cannot speak during an attack. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, when you think about what's going on during a panic attack is basically the part of your brain that is um, 
you're in fight or flight or freeze, right? So you're, that part of your brain's very active, your amygdala, but the part of your brain, your sort of frontal lobe, which is the part of your brain that does sort of your organization, your executive functioning pieces, um, you know, putting things together, sequential thinking, making decisions, um, impulse control, that part of the brain, we really have very little access to. Um, because the amygdala, the part that tells us we're in danger, kind of, uh, who calls it the amygdala hijack, amygdala hijack. Yes, General Goldman calls it the amygdala hijack because that part of your brain is saying nothing else matters except that you notice that you are in danger. You are in fight, flight, or freeze. That is the only thing that we care about as your brain is a way to keep you safe. And so all, all of these other functions, all these more intellectual functions, easily, easily go out the door. So it does make sense that people have trouble getting out a sentence and making sense of what they're saying. And we hear that all the time. We hear, I mean, about the interrupted speech that actually is way more common than people know. Mm -hmm. And, I, and I what can, can they imagine? do? Oh, I was going to say that could probably lead to more anxiety because yes. you probably think you're having a stroke or something. If that, well, happens. that yes. that is true. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's the thing about that's the thing about panic attacks that are so that are so difficult for so many of us, which is we panic about having a panic attack, right? We you know, part of what the amygdala is doing is telling us if you don't take care, you're going to die, right? Because all of this came from a time when we were really in danger a lot of the time from, from wild animals, from maybe other tribes coming over to kidnap us way back when, when people lived in constant danger and our brains don't want us to be like snacking on is from the bush when there's, you know, a very dangerous, you know, snake coming up to us, right? So our brain is, is constantly telling us, you are in danger. And that's why someone, so many of us think we're going to die during a panic attack. And then we start panicking about having panic. Yes. That's part of having a panic disorder. You start to realize that's a symptom of having a panic disorder. And has is everyone... Panicking. Has anyone so, ever calmed down by being told to calm no, down? Never no. in the history of calming down has anyone ever calmed down by being told to calm down? No, never. just checking. No, and it, and it, and we say that it's very shaming. Um, someone, I just saw a brief comment in the chat um, that came up, and someone was saying, you know, she was always told she's being oversensitive, or um, you know, women are often told relax, calm down, chill out. And it's, it's really very shaming because it's the idea that um, we could, if we would just, if we would just let ourselves, we could relax, you know, and, and the whole thing about being in that state of amygdala hijack or in that state of panic is that at that point, you can't just relax. It's not possible. Your brain will not let you do that. So it, it ends up really like downgrading what we're going through when and, we're really and anxious. It really, and it really makes it seem as though we're choosing it, mm -hmm. right? You know, well, you, since you have control over this, if you could just relax, you know, that implies that this is a decision we're making to be panicked and to have all these horrible symptoms and to worry that we're dying. It's a disorder. It's not a decision. When you are, when your amygdala is wonky and tends to see danger, even where danger doesn't exist, that's a disorder. That is not a choice that anyone makes. It's not a personality trait. It's not a moral failing. You're not lazy or undisciplined or flaky or all the things that we get called. And we do, we get, we get called those things. Um, those of us who have had to cancel things because our panic or our anxiety wouldn't let us do them. It's an invisible thing, right? People can't, it's not like if you break your leg and you're wearing a cast, People will trip all over themselves to bring you dinner, to tell you not to worry, but don't, I'll take, I'll pick up your kids for you. Don't worry. You know, I'll go grocery shopping for you. Oh my God, you can't do the stairs. I will help you get to the elevator. But if you have anxiety disorder, 
It's not something people can see. So no one is going to bring you a casserole and they're going to expect you to take not only that flight of stairs, but probably a few more extra flights as well, because you should just relax and then you can do it. Right. Yeah. And, and oh, it says, how do you manage anxiety at night that prevents winding down oh, and falling gosh. asleep? That is a big one. Yeah. Yeah. We, we actually <laughs> spent a lot of time talking to a group about this on Sunday night, actually. Um, and, and we know that that's a time of day where, you know, there are those of us who are morning anxiety people. And there are those of us who tend to go spinning at night. We tend to go around in the anxiety at night. Um, and most of the time, the treat, the way we deal with anxiety is pretty similar, whether it's at night or in the day, but at night, we really want to create but a sensory experience for ourselves that's very soothing. So that that might mean a lot of people have found help um, by listening to meditations. There's millions of them online. There's free apps and listening to night meditations or some people like night stories. There's this whole, there's this whole like bunch of things called like, you know, there are night stories for kids, there's night stories for adults, sort of soothing stories so that when you're going to sleep, when you're falling asleep, you're relaxing your body. We have people that use aromatherapy at night. Um, so they have, um, you know, they have sort of a smell going throughout their room from a diffuser. And just want to interrupt um, you for a second, Mags, when you, and here's a tip when you're using, let's just say you decide the scent that you're going to use is lavender. Don't use that scent at any other time except for when you're going to bed. Mm. Because your brain will start to associate lavender with winding down and relaxing. And yeah. you'll actually create a neural pathway where that smell will relax you. And then when you go to use it, it will it will have that effect. So pick a pick a flavor <laughs> or or a, an essential oil or something that you can just do at night and do it every night before bed. If you know if that's your worry time, if that's your rumination time. Just do that every night, even if it doesn't help in the beginning, it will, it will start, yeah. it will, it will, it'll takes about, I hate to say this, takes 66 days to create a habit for your brain. So you also want to, you also want to do that same thing with music. You know, if, if you like to listen to really calming music or certain sounds, you know, that um, some people like the sound of rain or sounds from the jungle, I don't know, um, whatever, whatever is appealing to you, if you start to use that at night, your brain will start to think like, I hear these sounds, this is shutdown time. So it really takes a lot of practice at what helps each individual. But, you know, there's not one thing we can give you, but it, but we know that when you establish a routine, your brain starts to understand like, okay, it's time to be quiet. It's time to shut down a little. Yeah. I mean, for night sufferers, it's a process. It's not going to, you know, there's nothing you can, I mean, short of taking a sedative, other than that, the only thing you can do to rewire your response is to pair it with some other some other habits, preferably one that's going to soothe your senses and distract you a little bit from from the rumination, because you know that that's what happens is, unfortunately, is because our brain brain is so plastic and it and it easily trains. We can train ourselves to be anxious at night. We don't mean to, but we do because we start off that first time, whenever that was, where we were ruminating and spinning about our to do list or about something that happened or any catastrophe that might be coming our way. And then when we started to do it again and again around the same time when we were going to sleep at night, our brain said, oh, shortcut, this is when we do this. So now we have to sort of find, we have to create a new path that's even stronger. So then your brain will say, oh, that's the shortcut I'm supposed to take at night. So that, that's how you use neuroplasticity to ease night panic. But you know, it, it's hard. It's really, it I just want to take how hard it all is. It's really hard. Yes. And also we interviewed, um, uh, a sleep expert, Dr. Schneeberg, who's ask, actually a member of Hello Revel. And Revel. I always say Hello Revel because that's the website. But she had mentioned keeping a little stash on the side of your bed, stay away from the phone, but maybe have a notepad. So if there's thoughts in your head that you need to get out, write them down. So you're kind of releasing those thoughts, but don't go on your phone. Don't do anything that would create active 
thoughts in your brain. So right. I guess that could go along with yes. what you were saying. Yeah, yeah, none of the blue light, you know, the computer, the phone, they all say that. And sometimes I I think that we we have talked about that it's helpful. Um, writing is very, very helpful at different times of the day. And sometimes it's helpful to say, set a timer and say, okay, I am going to write for seven minutes or eight minutes about all the things worrying me. But when that is over, you know, I'm going to take that pad and close it and I'm going to put it, or I'm going to, you know, put those worries somewhere else, not right next to my bed, literally kind of trying to cue your mind. Worry time is this much time. It's not all night long. You know, for many of us, it can easily be all night long. There's a question also um, that's a woman says that she's been diagnosed with panic disorder, agoraphobia, and OCD, and she's pretty much homebound. But Maggie, didn't you talk about agoraphobia? Yeah, I mean, I think Abby and I, between, you know, we've, we've both had, Abby has had the OCD, I've had the agoraphobia and the panic, and Abby's had- I got, tra- I got trapped by OCD for yeah. a few- yeah. yeah. Um, so we definitely understand. Um, did she have a question about um, any information that you might have on how okay. to overcome it? With OCD, the gold standard, the only way I have found to help myself other than using medication, which I do. And I and, and for me, it's really helpful um, is exposure therapy, which is basically you do what scares you until it doesn't scare you anymore mm-hmm. or you do what upsets you or makes you anxious. So, you know, I had tons of, you know, uh, problems with germs and that kind of thing. And really, that was that was rough. But, you know, I had to force myself to touch things that I was afraid to touch, go out of my house without gloves on, you know, I mean, I had to do all kinds of things that were really, really, really difficult, but ultimately enabled me to, to get out. And Maggie will tell you the same thing when she was, she became very afraid of transportation. And then it extended itself to her elevator and she lived on what floor? 16 in New York City. So So she was was really stuck. And, and I could, and I had trouble with the subway trains. I had trouble with buses and driving. And the thing about agoraphobia that I want to say is people always say, oh, it's fear of leaving the house. And that's not really what agoraphobia is. Um, it really is a fear of, say, having a panic attack when you're outside of the house and not being able to get to your safe zone or getting sick outside the house and not being able to get to your safe zone. So ultimately it shrinks your world quite a bit and where you really feel only safe at home. And every time you try to sort of leave that boundary of home, panic attacks crop up, which, you know, as anyone who's ever had one, that is not an easy thing to go through. Um, So Abby mentioned for the OCD, the exposure therapy. And um, we always recommend the International OCD Foundation. They are fantastic, fantastic group that um, we can't recommend enough. Um, And then for the panic and agoraphobia, first, I would say like Abby, you know, I needed medication. um, Because when you're at that point, where getting out of the house is too hard, it's really hard to like, people will say, Oh, go for a walk in nature or do this or do that. And you can't do any of those things if you can't get out of your house. So we really say there are times where medication is very personal issue, but there are times where it's going to be very, very helpful to help you do that kind of exposure therapy that, you know, maybe it's taking a step a couple of steps out of your house. Maybe it's going to the end of your driveway at first. You know, maybe it's walking down the street. It, you know, it sort of depends on your circumstances, but often exposure therapy without any medication when you're really, really trapped is is a lot to ask of yourself. Not impossible, but very hard. Can you repeat the names? Because I want to just type them out of the organizations that you recommended. Oh, sure. That was the International OCD Foundation. Yeah, and they, the IOCDF.org. Yeah, they are, they are fantastic. Okay. Amazing. 
Great conference too. Yeah, if, okay. <laughs> fantastic conferences. You said, you said uh, idocf.org? I O C D S. It's very confusing. It, <laughs> so yes. many letters. That's yeah. It's like International O C D Foundation. So okay. I -O -C -D was there another organization that you recommended just now, or did was that the I one? I don't that think so. Okay. I don't think so. For O C D, that that one you can't get better than that. Okay. Um, someone stuff. asked if they uh, if the Vagal, I think it's Vegas term, but if the Vagal yeah. nerve release YouTubes would access the amygdala. So it's so interesting. I've just been doing a lot of research on polyvagal theory because I tried that exercise with a therapist that it must be the one that's on YouTube where you lie there and you, your eyes go from one side to the other. Is that the one that's on YouTube? Okay. I'm so sure. I did that. Okay. Well, I did that um, with someone who's actually a therapist um, just to, to talk about it and, and sort of work it through for myself because people in our, our uh, sisterhood ask about it. For me, I couldn't, it could, not only could I not get it to relax me, but it actually heightened my anxiety a bit doing that. So it must have something to do with your amygdala because I definitely felt um, more panicky doing that exercise uh, than I did beforehand. So I do feel like it must have some connection there, but I did not for myself find it to be helpful um, doesn't mean that it isn't helpful, just that I didn't find it for myself that way. And I've, d I've done a lot of reading about polyvagal theory and there's um, parts of it that make a lot of sense to me, but I, I just don't know enough about it to really comment on the neuroscience yet, I'd have to say. I'm seeing a lot of, of comments that basically are saying, you know, the pandemic has caused mm -hmm. me to really either become agoraphobic or have panic attacks or really just maybe even real, you know, take what was a mental health condition and exacerbate it. What suggestions do you give people for the results of the pandemic? Because it's affected us all. It has. So um, we definitely hear from a lot of people that tell us, um, you know, that maybe they had some anxiety before, maybe they had really worked through pieces of phobias or panic issues, and now they're back with a vengeance, right? Because, and when you think about it, we were told for off and on for the last few years, stay home to stay safe. Now, Anxiety sisters, if we're good at anything, <laughs> we're, we're good at trying to listen to please to stay safe. We were in general, not the people that were out among the crowds during the height of the pandemic, right? So, you know, it really is a question that we've become extremely acclimated to being at home and that we, you know, for me, I know Abby practically had to drag me out of the house after that after the time where we were all home, you know, before vaccinations, once I was vaccinated and Abby had to like sort of come over and drag me out, you know, um, because I, I'm very comfortable at home. I didn't want to go out. Um, but it's, so it's really, is that exposure therapy? And the other thing we always say is the, this is where connection to other people connection to other communities is so, so important. Um, finding a way to stay connected to the people in your life when you have to be home, but then sort of having them help you prod, you know, help you get out when it's time to get out is so important. Having that sort of support system, building that support system, even saying to a friend, you know, I might need some help getting out you know, what can we do together? That kind of thing becomes so important because our brains want to stay safe. You know, uh, another person is struggling with the fear of many foods and she's saying eating disorders are a true phobia anxiety and Absolutely. no one gets the just eat is not possible. And, and yeah. I definitely empathize with that. I have a daughter who went through a serious eating disorder. And again, no one ever got helped by saying, calm down. No one ever got helped by saying, just eat. So do you guys okay. have some thoughts on that? Yes. Yes. You want to go abs? You want to start? Well, I mean, uh, okay. So as, as long as we're being honest here, I am recovering from BED. So a uh, binge eating disorder. So I really understand eating disorders. Um, and that's been something that I've been dealing with my entire life. And so 
nothing is worse than having somebody say, well, just try to, you know, eat sensibly and, and, and don't overdo it. It's the same thing as saying eat when you can't eat. I mean, these are, these are not recognizing that what we're dealing with are brain disorders, not choice. These are not choices we're making. These are things that are happening in our brain and we're responding to those messages in our brain. So the first thing that, um, that I do um, is um, I, I recognize that people, eat, I, I want to get angry when someone tells me just calm down, let's just say. And, and, and I think I, I'm trying really hard to see that people want to help, but they don't know how. And particularly around these invisible illnesses, people just don't know what to do. And Mags and I are learning because we've gotten to be particularly loud about our anxiety disorders. And I've gotten loud about my eating disorder in the last several years. We've learned that, you know, generally when people know better, they do better. So I am a big fan of educating people about, you know, what not to say and why in a really nice way, but to s simply say that, you know, like for anxiety and you can do this with eating disorders too, but when I'm in my fight or flight or freeze going, when that's going on in my brain, I can't make rational decisions. I can't control things. I can't just take a breath. Those things are not, you know, not accessible to me. And when someone tries to tell me to just do that, it only makes me feel worse because I can't can't and I want to do it more than you want me to do it so I think that sometimes just connecting and being really honest and saying you know when you tell me to eat that actually makes it worse for me because yeah I I, I know that and I, and I want that too I want that I want the freedom around food that I don't have but this is something that's going on in my brain so you you can be more helpful to me in that situation if you do this or if you say this so I think I think that's part of it is being yeah. able to educate people that's sort of what mags and i do every day is try to educate people about anxiety we're we're going to give people the benefit of the doubt just assume that they don't know what's going on because mm -hmm. frankly mags and i didn't know what was going on in our heads for 20 years so oh, it does God. make sense that these invisible illnesses like brain like, like, like eating disorders and like uh, anxiety and like depression these are things people genuinely need to be educated about so I, that's one one thing to start with i don't know what i don't exactly know what the I, I just know what you said, the person has trouble with certain foods or um, as part of an eating disorder. And it also sound, and it also can be very close to OCD um, when you have issues with certain foods. Um, so I've sat in on training sessions where I've seen therapists work with that in, um, when you're working with OCD, it's um, exposure and response. Prevention. Prevention. I forgot the name. That's exposure and response prevention therapy. And it's um, so it's a it's a very particular, not very complicated, but a very particular type of approach where um, they're really sort of helping someone, uh, someone kind of re approach those foods eventually. And it's and like anything else in exposure therapy, it's a painful process because part of what happens is our anxiety goes way up when we're doing things that are sort of a phobia or we're challenging an obsessive compulsive issue. So our anxiety goes way, way up. And that's part of the treatment, how to manage that. Um, so we would say in that case, you know, hopefully I'm hoping that you have someone who really knows that kind of therapy, the, yeah, uh, right. Exposure. PRP, PRP it's called. PRP. That's another place where we, we can't recommend the, um, International OCD Foundation enough because they, I, I would like to recommend, um, to, to go to Shala Nicely. Her last name is spelled yes. N-I-C-E-L-Y. Shala Nicely. She's a- Shala, I guess H-A-L-A. Yeah. Yep, Shala Nicely. And I see, nicely like you'd say, oh, you did that so nicely. She's mm -hmm. a lovely human being who has been suffering from OCD, really extreme OCD her entire life, has written a fabulous memoir called um, Is Fred in the Refrigerator? I highly recommend it. Um, and also she wrote Everyday Mindfulness for OCD for me I, I use it all the time her she she's and she and she does she's an expert in ERP 
think and she's a therapist. She's actually a trainer. And she's actually now taking patients again. She's doing virtual stuff. She lives in Georgia, but she's doing virtual stuff. But if you just go to her website, she has tons of free resources explaining things you can do. And she has definitely has a lot of experience with food phobias and, and, and OCD around food issues too. And, and her newsletter, which is, I think it's called Shoulders... Shoulders. Up. Anyway, she has a newsletter you can subscribe to. It's worth it. She's great. Yeah. And really helpful. She's wonderful. Yeah. And I just wanted to take a minute out to recommend that you guys check out the Anxiety Sisters website because there are a lot of resources on their website as well that would be helpful. And I think I put it in the notes. It's anxietysisters.com. We also did an episode on hot flashes and cool topics, which you can find on our website as well we're talking about anxiety. There are, there are resources out there, but I don't think people know where to look. Um, yeah. The website has uh, in the resources button on top of the homepage has a list of, I think, 25 organizations, including the International OCD Foundation. All you have to do is click on the button and there's a link. It'll take you, right, you there. right there. Okay. Also, for those of you who are talking about panic attacks <laughs> on our website, we have a panic button that you can press. No to your house. We don't know that you've pressed it. People are always like, are you sending someone to my house? And we're like, yeah, no, no. Um, it's good. We get, a, we get, what do we get? Like 1500 presses a week or so. We don't know who's pressed it. We just know how many times it's been pressed. And it's basically me, Abby, 1400 times. Of it. Yeah. Basically <laughs> Abby talking you talking someone sort of through a uh, panic attack. And I always laugh because my teenage son often presses it and knows Abby quite well, but finds her very, very soothing. We have a lot of teenagers that press it, older people. My everywhere. husband can't imagine why anyone would press that button. Yeah. <laughs> he does not find <laughs> <it> soothing. <Yeah. laughs> they always do their own. That is one thing we've learned. Yes. But it's, it's free. Everything on the website is free. So lots of resources, meditations. If you give us your email, which means you'll get a sporadic newsletter, definitely not monthly. I don't know when, like whenever we get to, get around to it. So it's not like you're going to get bombarded with mail, but if you give us your email address, we send you a, a progressive muscle relaxation, which is really nice. It's a, it's a nice thing to listen to for those night panic people can kind of get you in the mood sleep. Absolutely. You know, we're going to ask you guys to come back and do another oh, session yeah. of this oh, because yeah. one <laughs> hour is on you. you. <laughs> Middle-aged <laughs> middle -aged smart women. This is, this is our <laughs> um, oh. With another person mentioned that um, they learned from their PTSD treatments to talk to people about sensory things. So it almost yes. sounds like grounding. So yes. feel the earth on your feet. What's your favorite food? Imagine the taste of pie. Can you talk a little bit about things like grounding and sensory, kind of putting yourself back into the present moment? Sure. I mean, well, you know, what it, what's happening when you're having extreme anxiety or panic often is that our senses, because we are in that fight, flight, or freeze, right? So our senses become very, very heightened. Um, so for a lot of us, you know, we, things all of a sudden become very loud and lights become very strong, or we sort of feel like our body's floating above us. Abby and I call it floating. Other people call it depersonalization or disassociation. Um, fabrics start to bother us, you know. Um, we can smell things we don't want to smell. Yeah, uh, I, you know, I, I think those of us who have, tend to have sensory systems that are sensitive, are more likely, that's just my opinion, are like sort of more open to anxiety to begin with. But certainly when we, you know, really bad anxiety, those sensory systems go crazy. So part of what Abby and I talk about is being prepared for panic. And, a, and one of our keys in, in something we call a spin kit, but one of our keys is to have things to calm your senses. For those of you who get sort of floaty, right? or who feel yourself floating, uh, you know, a strong mint, something, a very strong taste can often ground you. Um, smells, certain smells can ground you, like, you know, having some essential oils or having um, a really nice smelling lotion to rub on yourselves. Um, what else apps do we have to ground people? Oh, here's our right. Spin that's kit. I was. Spin we're going to talk yeah. about the spin kit now, guys. So you're going to see some. Okay. Okay. So we're going to talk about yes. Yeah. So, our, so this is this is like my like Matt said. We believe in prepping for panic because here's the thing: 
most of what makes panic so awful is that it somehow it surprises us every time, right? It, it sneaks up on us. And, we're, and before we know it, we're panicking. And then the first thing we're saying is, why is this happening? I was just standing in the grocery store minding my own business. And now all of a sudden I'm sweating. Why? What's going on? So carrying a spin kit with you, which is our, our term for a portable first aid kit for anxiety, that means if you're going to carry a, a, a portable kit with you, it means you're ready for it. So when it shows up, you're not going to start by saying, why are you here? You're going to say, well, I'm an anxiety sister. So it's going to show up sometimes. I'm ready for you. And that makes all the difference because there's no such thing anymore as a, as a, a shock attack, right? Mm -hmm. It no longer becomes, it, it takes so much of the power away from the anxiety to surprise us. And I learned really quickly because I also, one of my diagnoses was also panic disorder. I learned really quickly how much I was able to deflate the power of my, of my panic. I mean, I couldn't stop it completely, but boy, I really reduced it by just carrying around a spin kit. And just like if you have an allergy, you'd carry an EpiPen. So should you carry a spin kit if you're an anxiety sister? So Max, you can tell them what's in our spin okay. kit. Okay. So of course the soother for your senses, which is so important, you know, what the smell that something to feel, or for some of us like to feel something sort of with a, a heavy texture or a, a little bit of weight, like a worry stone. Um, and then we also, some of us um, use something to like block sounds or, you know, even sunglasses. Earplugs. Earplugs. Right? Earplugs, sunglasses. Then we want to have distractors. And distractors are something just so you can focus on something other than the panic. We we always say, don't try to stop the panic attack. You won't be able to. It will be stronger than you. And in fact, what we pay attention to, we know grows. So, but what you want to do is try to give yourself something else that you can focus on or something you can do with your hands. I like to crochet you know, so I always have a little bit of a crochet project with me. Um, other people like to look at pictures of their cats or dogs, or um, some people like to color, you know. Fidget spinners even, those little fidget spinners. spinners. You know, anything you can use that will be a little bit distracting we'll be, to you. You know, anything that you can do with your hands, especially is really. Yeah, cool. yeah. Um, remember that your hands take up a lot of real estate in your brain. That means that they're, they're very good tools for grounding yourself in all ways. So some people even just rub their hands together and they find that grounding. And then the last piece is some symptom relief, whatever your symptoms are. I always had a bad stomach. I always had tea bags with me. Um, and you can see some of the things people use for their spin kits here. Um, mantras, having a mantra card. Because remember, when you're in the anxiety experience is not the time you can think about what's going to help me feel better. You have to sort of do that when you're feeling better. And you try out all different kinds of things. And then we just put it in like a Ziploc bag or a little makeup bag. Anything you can sort of carry around with you. Music, that's kind of what our idea is. And everyone's spin kit will be different because we all have different preferences. For instance, my spin kit has pictures of my cats, but if Maggie looked at pictures of my cats, it would make her panic. So that would not be in her spin I'm kit. I'm afraid of them. Yes, of her cat. <laughs> of her cat. Of her cats, particularly of her cats. <laughs> and, and, and you've never met two less frightening cats in all your life. They're ragdolls, <laughs> the sweetest things ever. Oh, they're, which very scary. they're very she, scary. They're terrifying. They're out for me. <laughs> <laughs> So okay. I thought Bridget was going to ask something. Um, oh, I was just looking at some of the other questions people are I, asking. I wanted to follow up with the gut because I know someone had a question yeah. about the gut. And there is a lot more science behind the gut relationship to the brain than people realize. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Abs, you want to? Sure, sure. So many people don't realize this, but we have two brains. We have the brain in the penthouse, right? The central nervous system up here. So that's our brain brain. And then we have a brain in our gut that's responsible for digestion. And, um, you know, people don't realize this, but 95% of our serotonin, which is our feel good neurotransmitter is made in our intestinal tract. Okay, so serotonin lives down here. It, of course, it travels up and down from the penthouse brain to your stomach brain via the vagus nerve. And that's where polyvagal theory comes in as well. But um, 
it really, there's so much, there's so much nerve activity in your stomach. There's so many neurons that it is actually considered a brain. Um, and so there's a new field out right now called neurogastroenterology, which is really the study of it's doctors that all they study and all they treat uh, is the connection between the top brain and your belly brain. Um, or I guess technically it's the central nervous system and the enteric nervous system, but they they call them two brains. And uh, they they've been doing some amazing research. Uh, Stephen Collins out of uh, McGill, oh McGill, McGill, McGill. out of oh, McGill, McGill, Canada, has done fantastic research with mice uh, doing fecal transplants. Right, which means that he's basically replacing the biome, the gut biome of anxious mice with calm mice. So he's taking the, make the biomes of calm mice through feces and transplanting it into anxious mice and then taking the anxious mice and transplanting their biomes into calm mice. And you know what happens? They switch. They switch. Wow. Anxious mice become calm, calm mice become anxious. So there, there's a lot of potential. I mean, for those of us with OCD, not that thrilling with the whole fecal part of it, but the idea that there's there's so much to learn about the role of our gut in our mental health. Um, you know, another another really exciting piece of research is now they know Parkinson's begins in your stomach. Mm -hmm. Wow! And Twenty yeah. years before you see any neurological symptoms such as tremors or you know any of the neurological symptoms we associate with Parkinson's. 20 years before that time, you can find lesions in the gut. The only thing I we want to always caution people is that there's a lot of people selling their wares based uh, on the gut biomes. Careful. And be very careful because while there have been some, while there's some great research out there, it, it hasn't a hundred percent translated into, you know, you have this, so you need this. You know, it hasn't. And so there's a lot of people saying, oh, this will fix your gut biome. And they really, a lot of times it's sort of. It's more not, complicated than Yes, that. It's, a, it's a very, there are, if you're interested in probiotics, there are a few people who really have a lot of experience in that one field and a lot of scientific training. But when someone's like, fix your anxiety by fixing your gut biome, I, I'm always suspect because, you know, we've done it. We have, Abby and I have like gone down a lot of rabbit holes <laughs> and, you know, spent a lot of money. And so, you know, we're just, um, and, and by the way, I do believe that um, a probiotic can be really helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know about managing anxiety, but in terms of making sure you have a healthy gut biome, but here's the thing, you have to make sure that it's personalized for yes. you. So taking just one off the counter, it, it, you know, it may not be what your gut needs. So for, for me, I had something done called NutraVal, which is a whole bunch of stool and urine and saliva testing to determine exactly what makes up my biome. And then I got a prescription probiotic that gave me the things that I needed. And they weren't the things I would have gotten from Whole Foods if I just picked the prettiest, uh, prettiest probiotic. So if you're not on antibiotics, then, you know, just be careful with the probiotic stuff. It can't hurt you to take them, but it, it, it's there's not a lot of research supporting taking probiotics is going to fix your anxiety. Well, that can is you, so interesting. Can you just oh, repeat I'm sorry, someone, just about the? Oh, oh no, I was on. just going to say someone asked about is it the Nutra? What did you call that it's again? Nutra uh, Nutraval N U T R E V A L. It's an expensive mm -hmm. test. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, it's an Sorry, Bridget. Test. I just wanted That's to. That's okay. Check was that was that something you found online, or you just no? Found I research? I was mm -hmm. you know Mags and I weren't kidding when in our book we said we tried <laughs> everything. Yeah, we literally have done everything. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I <laughs> so just that, you know that was one one path, and, and that was given by a very um, well known and sort of reputable, reputable. doctor in practice and. And so that's that's just what we're saying is that, you know, be careful where you put your resources. We know that they're, they're sort of limited resources and all of these people sort of are advertising, do this, do this, do this, and this will, this will help you, this will cure you. And some of them really don't have enough science behind them. 
Here's one thing I can promise you. If it's something that's powdery that you have to add water to and mix, it's not going to work, okay. whatever it is. I'm just telling okay, you. Okay, that is so helpful though, because well, it, you know, like you said, not, they're- Right, if it's not personalized for you too. Right, right. Because right. and I have different gut biomes. Yes, and yes. you know what, in a year, you may have a different gut biome than you have now, you know, right. so this, is, this is not and your biome that... changes in midlife around menopause because yes. hormones affect everything. So the biome that I had when I had mine tested at, you know, 46 is going to be different than the biome that I would have tested at 54. So it's just, but, but if you're interested in this stuff, we write about it in our book, but also um, there's a great book out there called the second brain. Mm -hmm. That, you know, if you're, yeah. if you're, if you don't, if you don't get scared off by a little bit of science, not even, it's not even too terrible, but it's, I mean, this guy, Emeryn Mayer, M-A-Y-E-R, he is so amazing. And he really explains the relationship between the gut and the brain. And, and really it makes sense, right? That now we know, we used to think that if you got anxious, then your stomach started to hurt. Now we know that that's not necessarily what happens. It could start that your stomach is hurting and then you get anxious. Right. Right? You know, in other words, the, the, the vagus nerve is a big two-way street. Mm -hmm. And so it, what we're learning is that things that we thought were all up in the head actually begin in the gut. Things that we thought were just gut have a lot to do with what's in our head. So the mind-body connection, that's, there's no such thing. The mind and body are one thing. We have a few more questions. Uh, sure. what, uh, one just said, what, uh, who do you use to measure for personalized probiotic? Is, uh, is that who you use? Or uh, you I, I see, uh, I believe in integrative and functional medicine. Um, so like the guy like Mark Hyman, people know who he is. He's very famous. So he's a function and functional medicine doctor. Um, so I, I see a doctor in a practice that, that that's part of what they do is they give you blood tests for things that typical doctors wouldn't. And you do the Nutraval and that kind of thing. So any, but any functional medicine right. practice or any integrative medicine practice or possibly even a good nutritionist will yeah. be able to, um, you know, it's not fun. You have to like carry, you know, you have to like pee in a, in a gallon jug for a full day. And then you have to do the same. You have to poop like three times. It's like, you know, not fun. You have to give them your hair. <laughs> they have to do a cheek swab. Oh. Very, wow. Wow. Not, it was, it made my OCD go off the charts. <laughs> <laughs> we had someone who is, for, um, wants to know about when their panic attacks manifest as rage. Yes. Mm. Yes. What well, any suggestions do you have for that? Anxiety, um, definitely manifests as anger in a lot of people. Um, and so they will feel, so people will feel that sense of rage or a lot of anger. And so I would say two things about it. One is, and this is with everything, Abby and I always say, we're real believers in self-compassion. We really love the work of Kristen Neff, who's sort of the mother of modern self-compassion. And so, um, she does a lot of uh, mindfulness work with self-compassion and we we think that it is so powerful and it was very transformative for the two of us. Um, we've trained with her. So give yourself a lot of compassion because remember you are in, it's fight, it's fl <laughs> fight, flight, or freeze. You are in fight when you get all that rage. It is, you know, your amygdala. Um, and so, can I stop you for a second? So, so, you know, communication wise, how we label things definitely shapes our experience of them. So maybe instead of thinking of, oh, I'm angry, maybe say, translate that to, oh, I'm anxious. Because that takes, in other words, that takes us to a different place of understanding what we're going through. Absolutely. And you know then, and then this would be a case where I would say, um, developing a mindfulness practice um, and I know everyone like sighs when we say meditation or breathing, and we talk a lot about it in our book um, in a very practical kind of way. So that might just be taking four deep breaths. That can be the start of your meditation practice. That can be a start of a great breathing practice, but you start to associate in your mind, I am feeling heightened like this, anxiety, anger, whatever you, you are feeling. And then you say, okay, let me take a pause here. Let me do four breaths or 10 breaths or whatever, whatever works for you. And 
you might find that with that pause, as you learn to develop that pause, your amygdala will calm down and you'll be able to use that frontal lobe. Your responses can start to become more measured and thoughtful and mindful. But if you label it as anxiety for yourself, that may help you get to the pause quicker because that's our, not when we're angry, that's not our first reaction. Our first reaction with anger is justification. Whereas our first reaction with anxiety is, you know, okay, I'm in this place of discomfort and that, so that pause can come in and help. Yeah, just understand the feeling in your body when that's starting to happen too. Because, because rage, as you're saying, is, is a very particular feeling and it's usually not just here, it's usually in the whole body. Hmm. Or did you want to ask the next question? Oh, no, no, I, I, I was trying to find it. So go ahead. I was looking. I know there's it. so <laughs> many, there's so Great many questions, questions here. What yes. are your thoughts about brain scans to determine the best treatment for mood issues? Yeah, Daniel Ammon does, uh, he, he's all, and he's got a new book coming out and he, yeah. he's, he's a really smart guy. He, I mean, there's a lot about his work I really admire, but he's, I think he's a little heavy on the scans. Um, I, I personally I, am not doing any scanning of my own brain for, for mood stuff. Um, I think, I think his scans, I mean, he's a really bright guy, so I don't want to sound, we don't want to sound like, oh, uh, delegitimizing him. But I, I think sometimes with all this stuff, we have to really make sure the science supports sort of how it's being used. And yeah, I mean, you know, anyone who's having panic or anxiety, like if you do a brain scan while they're in that state, you're going to see stuff, right? It, that's why we say it's a brain disorder. But I'm not always sure that everything out there is really supported yet by science and research. I think people have figured out how to market things. That said, though, I do. I mean, I have to be honest, there is a lot. I mean, I've read so much of his work. And yeah, he's, he's a really he's, brilliant man. And he has a lot of really good things to say. But I personally am not doing any scanning for mood disorders on my brain or and I'm not telling anyone that I know to do that. Yeah, it's a um, good way to put it. <laughs> what, uh, one of the guests was saying that she's actually gone to Dr. A is it Amen for um, a brain scan? And it was yes. fascinating and very helpful. But okay, rather great. expensive. Oh. She just said it rather yeah. expensive. Hi. Yeah. Uh, you know yeah. what? It, like one of the things that we talk about a lot is that different things help different people. And so we never want to say something is good or something is bad. There are cases where we want to say, just make sure because, you know, we all have limited resources, right? Time, money, energy. So just, just sort of reading up on the research, you know, I, I'm always looking at, sort of more and more, we're always looking at research and we're always saying like, okay, this one guy is saying this, how many other people are saying it? Not that that makes them wrong, but it's just where we're gonna put our resources. And also one thing that's really important for me and Mags to say to everyone is that one size does not fit all. Right. As a matter of fact, one size may not fit the same person two days in a row. And if you're going through menopause, you totally will get that. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, you know, what works for me doesn't necessarily work for Mags, which may not work for Colleen. It might not work for Bridget. I mean, in other words, we, and then something that works for Bridget today might not work for Bridget tomorrow. So one thing that we really recommend is having an arsenal of techniques and strategies because the breathing that was so helpful during that last panic attack, it may suddenly not help you in the next one. So, you know, every, there's different things that are going to help people at different times. And to be open to, you know, Mags and I are, are really against judging people's right. treatment plans. Whatever helps people be less anxious, we are for it. You know, life, you know, is hard enough without anxiety. So mm -hmm. whatever you do to take care of yourself so that your anxiety is not making your decisions for you, bravo. Mm -hmm. We really mean that, bravo, because it's hard. A final question someone okay. wrote, which is interesting. Anger wants justification. And anxiety once, and they left a question mark. Relief. Relief, that's what you The anger saying. doesn't want relief. That's not, when, when we're angry, that's, we're not thinking, oh, I would like to be relieved from my anger. We're thinking, I would like to explain to you why I am this feeling this mad. And I'm going to tell you what's wrong with the person who made me feel this. In other words, that justification is really where we want to go. I think anger wants 
certainty. I mean, I think, I'm sorry. I think anxiety wants certainty. Well, a certainty, that, a certainty that we really, you know, can't always have, but you know, this right. is definitely a disorder of doubt <laughs> and mm-hmm. fear. And so right. we want, we all want that safety and security and certainty. Yeah, I think she was talking about when we were ta- when we were saying how to reframe it. Oh, okay. Recognize when our, when our anger is because of we're in fight, flight, or freeze. To think of it, to try to think of it as anxiety, and knowing that it's our anxiety that's bringing about that anger will help us diffuse the anger a little bit because we won't be looking for the justification that keeps anger. I see. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. 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 Hmm. You have any thoughts? But if, you're, but if you're legitimately pissed, stay pissed. <laughs> <laughs> it's important. It's especially, it's especially important for women, yeah. you know, because I think yeah. a lot of times anxiety is because we're not allowed to express our anger as women. Yes. And on the next time we want to talk about, we didn't even get to a couple of questions on how it's happening so much for younger people now. Right. Mm-hmm. Their oh, anxieties. Oh. So we'll, this, <laughs> yes. So you'll yeah. have to co- see now you have to come back and talk about we that. Would love Can, to come back. You don't have to twist our arm. We love being with you guys. <laughs> oh, oh, we, we love well, having you. We do. It's same so helpful. here. Same. You, you guys are just always so helpful and just a calming presence. Would Thank you have any you. final thoughts or suggestions for people who are really struggling right now with either their OCD or their agoraphobia or any other issue that anxiety, whatever they might have? Uh, I'll say this just know you're so not alone that look at look at all these fantastic women in this room with you and and out i mean mags and i we can't believe it that that we have met so many thousands of people all feeling a lot of the same stuff that we're feeling so you are not alone healing from anxiety is not a solo project so reach out to people come come hang out on our facebook page we do every tuesday night we do a uh, we call it a book group, but we we go over a chapter of the book, but we tend to give new information. It's totally free. Um, and uh, we're doing it tonight, right? right? Mags, what are we doing tonight? Which one? We're doing Eastern medicine and anxiety. Oh, Eastern medicine and acupuncture and anxiety and stuff. So if you're interested, show up at our Facebook page at seven o'clock and you'll see us. Um, and we, you know, we do a lot of, 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 of helping people connect with other people in the same situation so that they have designated anxiety buddies. So just don't go it alone is what I would say. Somebody Our wanted face- to know your Facebook page. Yeah. Anxiety sisters. Oh, yeah, that's it. it. Yeah. Seven o'clock Eastern time. Yeah. Seven o'clock oh. Eastern time. I keep forgetting yeah. to say that. That always happens. Yeah. And we, we record it so that if you miss it, you, miss or, it, you can find it in the videos on our Facebook. You can page. find it on our Facebook page. And well, thank you guys for, for coming on here and sharing some really, really important yes. information. I think you helped a lot of women in this session. Mm-hmm. You helped us. I mean, I, yes. I feel better already. So there you go. When yes. Are coming, when are you coming on our podcast to talk about menopause? Uh, Whenever anytime you want us, let twist us know. Like, yeah. This okay. is the most, I mean, that is such a uh, important topic because so important. Midlife you know, no menopause. <laughs> yeah. It causes anxiety. It, they go, it's a cycle. Both like, menopause okay. just causes Fin cycle. So many yes. things. And as women, we often don't have places where we're really educated about it other than, oh, you're going to get hot flashes, which is, of course, hot flashes, cool topics, but there's so much else and we don't get educated, on, unfortunately. So we would love to have and you. Just, Any by the time, way, I'll guys. You, I'll leave you with this one thought about hot flashes. So there's a connection between hot flashes and anxiety, which is that we often have hot flashes during menopause at night even when we're sleeping, which is why we wake up drenched and have to change the sheet sometimes. But when our body gets hot at night, if you are a panic sister, then that will trip your fight or flight response, which is why some women wake up in a panic when they're in menopause, because mm-hmm. that heat convinces okay. the body that, that there's problems. Oh, wow. Just so you know, your hot flashes can also make you be Great. more. Make that, yes. Anything, oh, wow. do you guys, could you guys possibly type in the link for your Facebook? Because some people aren't on Facebook anymore and they want to be able to link oh. your- You know the link? It's, I think it's just facebook.com slash anxiety sisters. Yeah, if okay. you go onto Facebook, just type in anxiety sisters on the top and you'll get to our Facebook live page. Now you're telling people who don't know about Facebook, just type they it know, in. They're just like, not on it anymore. <laughs> no, no, they, they're not on it anymore. They were on it. So that's why I'm saying I, I saw it. If, if anybody has any questions about this, you can email us at hotflashes.com 
cooltopics yeah. at gmail.com and, and we'll and find also, the answers. Just so you know, Mags and I answer every email we get. It takes a few days, but we answer every email we get. So if you would like to- uh, What's to your email? Abs and Mags at anxietysisters.com. There we go. I'm typing it now, everybody. Or if you are on Facebook, you can PM us on Facebook or DM or, or whatever. Instagram it's even. I mean, I sometimes figure out how to do that, the messaging. On yeah. <laughs> well, guys. Don't try Twitter. But yeah. Yeah. Don't, yeah. yeah. That is not and, our milieu. <laughs> uh, and don't I, even get us started on TikTok. Our anxiety goes up just thinking about it. No, no, we're I not even. <laughs> I do it, but it makes me anxious. Yes, I have to use, I have to get my kid out. Have to get my kid out for that one. Oh God! No. <laughs> Thank you You're guys not even so Thank much, you, everyone, and we really, really, really appreciate you, everyone. It. Thank you. Have a great Thank day, you. everybody. Have thanks, a great everybody. day, everybody. Thank you. Bye. 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 And thanks, Michelle, for about the New York Times article. Thank you so much. What's New York Times article? What? Can oh, she sure. said there's a New York Times article that talks about calling. And we talk a lot about it in our book um, in a very practical kind of way. So that might just be taking four deep breaths. That can be the start of your meditation practice. That can be a start of a great breathing practice. But you start to associate in your mind, I am feeling heightened like this, anxiety, anger, whatever you, you are feeling. And then you say, okay, let me take a pause here. Let me do four breaths or 10 breaths or whatever, whatever works for you. And you might find that with that pause, as you learn to develop that pause, your amygdala will calm down and you'll be able to use that frontal lobe. Your responses can start to become more measured and thoughtful and mindful. But if you label it as anxiety for yourself, that may help you get to the pause quicker because that's our not when we're angry, that's not our first reaction. Our first reaction with anger is justification. Whereas our first reaction with anxiety is, you know, okay, I'm in this place of discomfort and that, so that pause can come in and help. Yeah, just understand the feeling in your body when that's starting to happen too. Because, because rage, as you're saying, is, is, a very particular feeling. And it's usually not just here, it's usually in the whole body. Mm. Or did you want to ask the next question? Oh, no, no, I, I, I was trying to find it. So go ahead, I was looking. I know it. there's so <laughs> many, there's so Great many questions, questions here. What yes. are your thoughts about brain scans to determine the best treatment for mood issues? Yeah, Daniel Ammon does, uh, he, he's all, and he's got a new book coming out and he, yeah. he's, he's a really smart guy. He, I mean, there's a lot about his work I really admire, but he's, I think he's a little heavy on the scans. Um, I, I personally am not doing any scanning of my own brain for, for mood stuff. Um, I think, I think his scans, I mean, he's a really bright guy, so I don't want to sound, we don't want to sound like, oh, uh, delegitimizing him. But I, I think sometimes with all this stuff, we have to really make sure the science supports sort of how it's being used. And yeah, I mean, you know, anyone who's having panic or anxiety, like if you do a brain scan while they're in that state, you're gonna see stuff, right? It, that's why we say it's a brain disorder. But I'm not always sure that everything out there is really supported yet by science and research. I think people have figured out how to market things. That said, though, I do. I mean, I have to be honest, there is a lot. I mean, I've read so much of his work. And yeah, he's, he's a really he's, brilliant he's, man. And he has a lot of really good things to say. But I personally am not doing any scanning for mood disorders on my brain or and I'm not telling anyone that I know to do that. Yeah. Um, good way to put it. <laughs> what, one of the guests was saying that she's actually gone to Dr. O is it Amen for Amen. a brain scan? And it was yes. fascinating and very helpful. But okay, rather great. expensive. Oh. She just said it rather yeah. expensive. I, yeah. You know yeah. what? It, like one of the things that we talk about a lot is that different things help different people. And so we never want to say something is good or something is bad. There are cases where we want to say, just make sure because, you know, we all have limited resources, right? Time, money, energy. So just, just sort of reading up on the research, you know, I, I'm always looking at, 
sort of more and more, we're always looking at research and we're always saying like, okay, this one guy is saying this, how many other people are saying it? Not that that makes them wrong, but it's just where we're going to put our resources. And also one thing that's really important for me and Mags to say to everyone is that one size does not fit all. Right. As a matter of fact, one size may not fit the same person two days in a row. And if you're going through menopause, you totally will get that. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so, you know, what works for me doesn't necessarily work for Mags, which may not work for Colleen. It might not work for Bridget. I mean, in other words, we, and then something that works for Bridget today might not work for Bridget tomorrow. So one thing that we really recommend is having an arsenal of techniques and strategies because the breathing that was so helpful during that last panic attack, it may suddenly not help you in the next one. So, you know, every, there's different things that are going to help people at different times and to be open to, you know, Mags and I are, are really against judging people's treatment plans, whatever helps people be less anxious. We are for it. You know, life, you know, is hard enough without anxiety. So whatever you do to take care of yourself so that your anxiety is not making your decisions for you, bravo. We really mean that, bravo, because it's hard. A final question someone wrote, which is interesting. Anger wants justification and anxiety wants, and they left a question mark. Relief. Relief, that's what you The anger doesn't want relief. That's not, when when we're angry, that's, we're not thinking, oh, I would like to be relieved from my anger. We're thinking, I would like to explain to you why I am this feeling this mad. And I'm going to tell you what's wrong with the person who made me feel this. In other words, that justification is really where we want to go. I think anger wants certainty. I mean, I think, I'm sorry. I think anxiety wants certainty. Well, absolutely. A certainty that we really, you know, can't always have, but you know, this is definitely a disorder of doubt (laughs) and fear. And so we want, we all want that safety and security and certainty. Yeah, I think she was talking about when we were ta- when we were saying how to reframe it. To, oh, okay. To recognize when our, when our anger is because of we're in fight, flight, or freeze. To think of it, to try to think of it as anxiety, and knowing that it's our anxiety that's bringing about that anger will help us diffuse the anger a little bit because we won't be looking for the justification that keeps anger. I see. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. 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 Hmm. Do you have any final but thoughts? But if you're legitimately pissed, stay pissed. <laughs> <laughs> it's, important. It's, especially, it's especially important for women, yeah. you know, because I think yeah. a lot of times anxiety is because we're not allowed to express our anger as women. Yes. And on the next time we want to talk about, we didn't even get to a couple of questions on how it's happening so much for younger people now. Right. Mm-hmm. Their oh, anxieties. Oh. So next we'll, book. Yes. <laughs> so you'll yeah. have to come, see now you have to come back and talk about we that. Love Can, to come back. You don't have to twist our arm. We love being with you guys. <laughs> oh, oh, we love well, having you. We do. It's so same helpful. here. Same. You guys are just always so helpful and just a calming presence. Would you have any final thoughts or suggestions for people who are really struggling right now with either their OCD or their agoraphobia or any other issue that anxiety, whatever they might have? Uh, I'll say this just know you're so not alone that look at look at all these fantastic women in this room with you and and out i mean mags and i we can't believe it that that we have met so many thousands of people all feeling a lot of the same stuff that we're feeling so you are not alone healing from anxiety is not a solo project so reach out to people come come hang out on our facebook page we do every tuesday night we do a uh, we call it a book group, but we we go over a chapter of the book, but we tend to give new information. It's totally free, um, and uh, we're doing it tonight, right? right? Mags, what are we doing tonight? Which one? We're doing Eastern medicine and anxiety. Oh, Eastern medicine and acupuncture and anxiety and stuff. So if you're interested, show up at our Facebook page at seven o'clock, and you'll see us. Um, and we, you know, we do a lot of of of. of helping people connect with other people in the same situation so that they have designated anxiety buddies. So just don't go it alone is what I would say. Somebody wanted to know your Facebook page. Yeah. Anxiety sisters. Okay, <laughs> that's it. it. Yeah. Seven o'clock Eastern time. Yeah. Seven o'clock Eastern time. I keep forgetting to say that. That always happens. Yeah. And we, we record it so that if you miss it, you, miss or it, you can find it in the videos on our Facebook. You can find it on our Facebook page and well, thank you guys for, for coming on here and sharing some really, really important information. Yes. I think you helped a lot of women in this session. Mm-hmm. You helped us. I mean, I, yes. I feel better already. So there you when go. Yes. Like, and, when are you coming on our podcast to talk about menopause? Uh, uh, anytime. Twist our yeah. This okay. is the most, I mean, that is such a, 
huh. important topic because so important. you know, we know menopause. <laughs> yeah, it causes anxiety. It, they go. It's a cycle. Both like, menopause okay. just causes Fin cycle. cycle. So many yes. things. And yeah. as women, we often don't have places where we're really educated about it other than, yeah. oh, you're going to get hot flashes, which is, of course, hot flashes, cool topics, but there's so much else mm -hmm. and we don't get educated, on, unfortunately. So we would love to have and you. Just, and so I'll, leave guys. You, I'll leave you with this one thought about hot flashes. So there's a connection between hot flashes and anxiety, which is that we often have hot flashes during menopause at night even when we're sleeping, which is why we wake up drenched and have to change the sheets sometimes. But when our body gets hot at night, if you are a panic sister, then that will trip your fight or flight response, which is why some women wake up in a panic when they're in menopause, because mm -hmm. that heat convinces okay. the body that, that there's problems. Oh, wow. Just so you know, your on. hot flashes can also make you be Great. more like that. Yes. Anything. Oh, wow. Do you guys, could you guys possibly type in the link for your Facebook? Because some people aren't on Facebook anymore and they want to be able to link oh. your... You know the link? It's. I think it's just facebook.com slash anxiety sisters. Yeah, if you go onto Facebook, just type in anxiety sisters on the top and you'll get to our Facebook live page. And you're telling people who don't know about Facebook, just type they in. Know, they're just like, not on it anymore. <laughs> no, no, they, they're not on it anymore. They were on it. So that's why I'm saying I, I if, saw it. If anybody has any questions about this, you can email us at hotflashes cool yeah. topics at gmail.com and, and we'll and find also, the answers just so you know mags and i answer every email we get it takes a few days but we answer every email we get so if you would like to uh, what's your email contact, abs and mags at anxiety sisters.com there we go i'm typing it now everybody or if you are on facebook you can pm us on facebook or dm or, or whatever instagram even i mean i sometimes figure out how to do that the messaging on yeah. <laughs> Well, guys, don't try Twitter, but yeah, yeah. Don't, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that is not and, our milieu. <laughs> uh, and don't I, even get us started on TikTok. Our anxiety goes up just thinking about it. No, no, we're I not even. <laughs> I do it, but it makes me anxious. Yes, I have to use. I have to get my kid out. I have to get my kid out for that one. Oh God, no. <laughs> thank You're you guys so much, thank you, everyone, and we really, really appreciate you, everyone. It.